So Derek, uh, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time today to uh, speak with me. Um, people don't know this, but I've been in the crypto space um, since the very early days. Um, and so I've, I've been in a lot of different deals and, I, and I've also been um, advising folks working on crypto companies, um, new technologies for the blockchain. Um, so, you know, while I'm not uh, you know, at the level of uh, Satoshi, uh, I'm definitely you know, knowledgeable about the space. And, and when I consider uh, different opportunities, um, I, you know, I, I have a bunch of questions I usually ask. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also want to understand the longer term vision of the founding team sure. um, and, and sort of understand if, if, if a company has a longer term vision. So with that, I, I, today I thought, and we just have a, an open and frank discussion about what you guys are doing, and, and um, hopefully that'll be also useful to listeners. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for having me. Really appreciate it. It's always uh, great to talk to um, veterans in the cryptocurrency community. Uh, I kind of got into a little bit um, while I was in China. I actually lived in China eight years. I started a business there, and I saw it uh, manifest in China. So it's always interesting to see how it's been growing and how this movement is, is uh, I think, not just a fad, but an actual permanent movement. So uh, really looking forward to all the innovation that's going to happen over the next few years. Terrific. And um, just uh, to get started, where are you guys uh, presently based? So our, our headquarters are basically we incorporated in the British Virgin Islands, but our offices are essentially the internet, the world. Uh, all of our employees are basically working in different parts of the world. Uh, Romania, Egypt, Costa Rica. I reside personally in Miami, Florida. I used to live in China and then I moved back uh, last year. Uh, you know, for us, one thing that we learned a long time ago, at least with running businesses, is that sometimes you have to find the best talent and sometimes that best talent may not be where you're physically located. So what we decided to do is basically work with a team uh, that's all over uh, essentially to um, you know, work together to, you know, get the project done as, as best as possible. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. In my own work, um, you know, we, we find that there are pools of talent now in different countries, different cities, actually specialists in certain regions as well. Um, and so most of my projects are distributed globally like that. So yeah. very comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of um, the rest of the team, the key people on the team, um, are they also um, kind of in the U.S. or are they also distributed? Yeah, so John Singh, our chief marketing officer, is in the U.S. Joseph Bassetti is in the U.S. in Miami. Uh, our advisor, Sunarok, which is uh, Justin Vallow, he's our, he's our blockchain auditor, but he's basically looking at our code in regards to the blockchain uh, in order to make sure that it's sufficient to the standards that we want. He's in Florida as well. Um, and then we have everybody else offshore. Romania, we have Egypt, which is our designer, UX. Romania is the backend application developer. And Carlos Salazar, who's our CTO, he's in Costa Rica and Romania. So he travels back and forth. The eventual goal is to have an actual development team in Romania, uh, given the amazing talent that you can get in that country. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. And tell me a little bit more about uh, Sunarok and his role. Yeah, so Sunarok essentially about three or four years ago created a cryptocurrency called Verge. Uh, essentially, it's a privacy security focused uh, currency coin. And so what the difference is, is they do a lot of proof of work. So he was m very into mining. And so uh, he wanted to have a coin that actually was very focused on privacy making sure that IPs are pretty much hidden. He believes that at the end of the day, you can have public transactions, but if you need to be able to be anonymous to make simple transactions, you can be. You have the basically right to do that. Um, if you think about it, 100 years ago, everybody was pretty anonymous, right? I, I guess once internet kind of came in and uh, social media came in, it's pretty hard to really just be you know, kind of anonymous and not knowing what's going on, right? Um, so he felt that that was kind of a right. And so when we started working on our project and the, the features that we wanted, we contacted him, we respected him and what he's done. And we said, listen, we're, we're doing this project. Do you think that you can look at everything, make sure it's up to standards? We knew that he obviously had credibility in the crypto community space. 
And so that's why, you know, he, he joined, you know, kind of helping us in that, in that regard. Yeah, and that's, that's actually a thing I look for is, is some kind of external audit or outside uh, view from a trusted third party um, when I look at deals. And, and so it's, it's good to see that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, also along the same lines, um, how does uh, token pay compare to Zcash, for example, um, or other well-known privacy-focused uh, coins or, or uh, projects? Yeah, when you look at the actual technology, we actually integrate with Tor, so we actually immediately hide your IP addresses from day one. Uh, we also have integrated chat, so our wallet system actually has an ability to, to, to be more than just a transaction. It is actually a tool where you can communicate and have transactions through communication to secure communication. Uh, also, Zcash doesn't really have a roadmap or a vision that, that I've seen that's really more about getting the crypto or at least the wealth that's been created to crypto into more of the hard assets or the monetary aspect. What we looked at was that what was, what, what was the formula essentially to make a very successful um, blockchain and as well as, you know, cryptocurrency, right? What is it that's going to make it into a mass adoption type of, uh, you know, situation, right? So what we looked at was the biggest problem was banking. Even though crypto in itself is essentially anti-banking, at the end of the day, you still need it, right? I mean, you can have 40, $50 million of cryptocurrency, but if you're not able to convert it, some of that to a fiat currency without being judged by a bank, then um, it's, it's kind of hard to really do it, right? So what, what's happening is those people are banking on the fact that everything's gonna be crypto. You're gonna purchase everything in crypto, and that's gonna take a while. Uh, if you're looking at five to 10 years where a lot of larger transactions are starting to be accepted with crypto, right? You can do micro transactions, little things here and there, but until you can purchase, let's say property with crypto, I mean, I know you can do it in a small scale, but when you do it on a large scale, that's when, that's when it becomes extremely interesting. So we decided to look into purchasing a bank. We actually have a letter of intent to purchase a bank in Vanuatu. Um, we picked Vanuatu because it's a very privacy focused jurisdiction. So, of course, if you are an offshore client and you want to purchase um, and you want to actually open up a bank account, you would obviously have to follow the KYC, and, uh, which is know your customer anti-laundering laundering laws. But that relationship is just between you and the bank. If there's obviously any issues between government officials or whatever, you know, that's obviously between the bank and the government, right? And any negotiation ever that takes place. But it's a, anybody that works in Vanuatu at a bank they cannot release information on any client. And if they do, illegally, they go to prison for 20 years, right? So that's kind of sticking to the theme of privacy and security, right? Then the next phase of that is essentially putting in the merchant services, which we think that would be a great way to have many businesses adopt the actual currency and start using it. Uh, adoption is important. So if you have businesses able to accept it and users that are willing to use that currency for because of the features, then that creates adoption. And then the last phase is the debit card. The debit card is definitely to create adoption on a consumer level. It just takes time. It takes a lot of time. You have to make sure that you have everything integrated in place uh, with everything. You have to have an exchange in place. You have to have the banking in place. And, you know, just once you have all of that together, you have a really good solid solution for the actual industry. Right, and so that's that's sort of the big picture vision uh, of kind of what you're doing. Um, and we, if we zoom in a little bit um, on just the advantages of uh, some of the kind of key technical dimensions of this project uh, compared to others, uh, and keeping in mind that some of the people listening probably aren't very technical, uh, maybe we can just quickly talk about um, each of the major points. So for people who don't know what Tor is, um, you know, quickly, maybe just a, a you know, few words about Tor, and then let's talk about some of the key um, technical attributes about um, the, the way that you're securing this, um, the different kinds of transactions that, that you're supporting, and, and why, um, why you think that's necessary compared to what's already available in the crypto space. Okay, great. So let's start with Tor. So Tor, the way it works is essentially you log into the actual network. They basically have a decentralized network in, in regards to running Tor. And then once your computer IP address goes into one aspect of the network, it goes in through a series of computers and different IP addresses and, 
different things and it converts it into what they call an onion address. And so when you are browsing the web through their browser, instead of going to a .com, you basically go to a .onion address. And it's essentially a very encrypted and very hard way to know um, who you are or at least where you are. So, right. So, so, for, so basically the idea with Tor, uh, for folks who are listening, is, is that it, anonymize, it anonymizes uh, you um, and so that you're effectively browsing and, and using the web yeah. uh, or the internet uh, you know, really anonymously. Tor, Tor gets a bad rap. People have to understand that the internet back in the day was anonymous to some extent. Um, and the world was anonymous. You could walk around and nobody really knew. But now with the cell phone and smartphone, everybody knows everything. And you can be targeted specific ads by walking in front of a, a retail store and you get a pop-up saying, would you like to get a discount? And I think a lot of people don't want to be tracked. And even if you go to your Chrome browser and you go to incognito mode, that's a version of Tor. The difference is, is you know, the, the level of encryption is much higher. And so... There are people out well, there. Well, it's not actually, they're not actually using Tor um, in, in incognito no, no, mode. No, I know they're not, but the aspect of being right. incognito, right? I mean, that's... Anonymous, yeah. Correct, yeah. Correct. And you have that in your Chrome browsers, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, it yep. just gets a bad rap, and I think that's unfair. Yep. And I think it, it gets yep. always linked to a nefarious activity, and that's not the case. Obviously, there are people that abuse that, but, you know, that's not what we encourage. Right. I think that's, inter that's an interesting point, um, you know, the anonymity... Um, you know, has has benefits and and can can open up mm -hmm. um, commerce and communication as well. Uh, it's right now, yes. There's been you know it's gotten a bad rap because of misuse of Tor, um, but um, it, it, there definitely are going to be and and have been positive uses. And and it's interesting to see um, you know positive uses such as uh, what you guys are doing with Token Pay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if we talk about um, just you know at a very high level. Um, the kind of key technical advantages of, of your platform and your approach, um, what are they, number one? And then just why or you know, why is it needed? How do, you, how do you compare this to other uh, competing or existing uh, solutions out there? Why, is, why does the world need a token pay? Yeah, I think the biggest or the biggest differentiation in regards to technology is the quality of the zero knowledge proof. A lot of these cryptocurrencies, uh, a lot of people aren't aware, they're actually mutations of mut mutations of mutations. So Bitcoin essentially was the first source code. That was the, the foundation of a house. Let's, let's put it that way to, to make it more macro. And then what ended up happening was developers started coming in and creating new features and new features and new features to essentially make more robust blockchains. So what we did was combine all of the best features that's out there and we modified a few things in regards to the zero knowledge proof. The zero knowledge proof is essentially when you link zero knowledge proof with dual key self addressing, that's essentially what makes everything work. Um, a lot of people don't understand how this works and I'll give you a perfect example. I'll try as best as I can to simplify it. So uh, self address means instead of a 15 digit uh, hash address, you have a much longer uh, address and then that's even more encrypted. That's what makes it even more stealth. The other thing is it's not registered on a blockchain, so you can make transactions that you can keep private with somebody. So let's say I, if I send you, you know, $1,000, but you don't want anybody to know that I sent you $1,000, you can, you can do that. But the minute you take that transaction and you go on an exchange and you transfer that money to fiat, I mean, that's all recorded, right? So between me and you, the entire time, we can go back and forth, you know, exchanging T-Pay, essentially that sales still says anonymous. So how does zero knowledge proof work? I'll simplify it as best as I can. So what happens is I send you T-Pay and it goes into the actual code, which is the zero knowledge. And what it does is it breaks down the T-Pay and makes it into a temporary coin, right? And let's call it temporary T-Pay. And what it, way it works is it stays in this zone essentially until you, the user that receives it, wants to take it out as many times as you want, whenever you want, et cetera. And then once you receive it, then it automatically goes back into T-Bay and goes back to you. So that is what makes it more anonymous and secure in, in regards to how you can kind of, you know, have these transactions. Why? Right. There's a degree of separation for, for the transaction where uh, it makes it much harder to figure out um, kind of what happened. 
And I, and I think what people don't understand is if, I, if me and you were in a room and I gave you $100 and you gave me $100 back and we go back and forth exchanging the same $100 or whatever, that's anonymous. Only me and you know that, right? Uh, the rest of the world does not know that. And I think what people understand or have this misconception is that, oh, because you're hiding, you must be doing something wrong. So, no, not necessarily. I just don't want everybody to know that I sent this to you. Let's assume that you know, I had a million dollars of, of assets in my computer or I made, my, made a transaction, a very large transaction for $400,000 to buy a property or whatever. And people know that I'm doing it from my phone or they're doing it from my computer. And so all of a sudden I may be a target. They may somehow find out that, you know, what my IP address is, where I'm located, et cetera. And they know that I have extremely a, a lot of assets in my computer or my heart or whatever. And if I send you a transaction, it could be a target. And so a lot of people, they're kind of scared of, of this type of situation with the banks. Yeah, you can go and, and, and make large transactions, but there's a process, there's fees, there's all these things that kind of come into play. So I think, you know, when you look at cash itself versus what we're trying to do, we're, we're really providing the same thing, just definitely more digital. And I think that's why, you know, I want to try to, as best I can, try to eliminate the stigma of the, you know, nefarious activity or anything like that. Cause I really, I've never done anything illegal in my life. I've never done any drugs. I've never, I've, I've never committed a crime and there's no way that I would do this without the intention that this is the you know good thing because I do believe in privacy. I do believe that's extremely important. I lived in China for eight years and I understood what big brother is for real. And when you see the things you say, you, you start to value a right of right of having a certain level of privacy. And I think that's important for people who you know, are wanting to do transactions with, you know, cash or whatever, or cryptocurrency. And I just, just the way I feel. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so since we're talking about that, um, let's talk about the, the sort of bigger um, context here, which is, you know, the crypto space in general, it still represents a, a relatively tiny portion of the kind of global economy. But as more of the global economy flows into various cryptocurrencies, uh, there could be a point in the future where uh, the crypto economy starts to actually have the potential to um, really disrupt the fiat economy. And at that point, you know, if not significantly before that point, you know, one would expect the central bankers and um, tax authorities and others to, to get really concerned sure. um, and, to, and to legislate against um, the crypto space as, as strictly as it can. Mm -hmm. um, at least in order to regulate it um, you know, with perhaps the uh, rationale that they're trying to protect the, the overall global economy or national economies um, from you know, volatility due to manipulation that's outside of their mm -hmm. purview or they can't see. Yeah. So, you know, with all of that said, um, you know, where do you see this going? What happens if the crypto economy um, succeeds in, in really gaining, you know, a, a really significant or even equal uh, market share, if you will, to the fiat economy. And, and with that in mind, how do, you know, anonymous systems like token pay kind of play into that for better or for worse? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a very good question. And I, and I want to start from more of a macro level. And I think, why is it that if you look at the adoption, why it's increased so fast? You look at the current. Look at the countries that probably need a new, a new, um, a new chapter in, in in what they're doing with their currencies or government. Right? You see countries like Venezuela, countries like Greece are having crises. Crises, countries like Cyprus where they've had their bank accounts closed for for weeks. You know they had bank runs, and people are scared of the fact that the government has way too much control over people's assets. Right? People don't understand like things like the FDIC and how it protects Americans and. With deposits, I mean, there is uh, the amount of deposits and reserves that even our own government in the United States has for protecting that is it's actually not enough, and it's actually pretty scary. So, what I think, when regards to adoption, I see more currencies or more countries that have weaker currencies or they have weaker governments adopt it much faster than, say, countries like the U.S. And I think that's where you're you know, in a way, it's it's kind of interesting. It's analogous to what happened with with mobile technologies, where exactly. Um, exactly. more established countries um, have older infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, countries that adopted mobile technologies or were smaller, and they adopted these technologies uh, later, actually have more modern infrastructure. Yeah. They were they are actually ahead of the U.S. And so, in an interesting yeah. way, 
there is an opportunity for these kind of smaller countries to leap exactly right. really forward and actually create and actually create um, you know new forms of kind of incentive to do business with them. Yeah, I well, while I was in China, I you know started a business there and everything was cash, everything was a debit, and then it became debit card. And all of a sudden, I saw this explosion of WeChat and everybody making mobile payments and the vendors down the street um, just collecting WeChat, which is, you know, the, the, the chat application. It's like the WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger of China. And I, I was like so impressed. And I, I was, I, then I started dating and I got married to a Chinese uh, woman, my wife. Uh, and uh, I asked her, like, what did you grow up with? Like, what technology? And she basically said her first computer was a laptop. They skipped 20 years of technology innovation that we have experienced. VHS tech, tapes, I mean, you name it, right? And when you go into these new countries that literally skip generations of technology for whatever reason, and then they come up and they get really updated, you know, there's a lot of vested interest, et cetera. They go in and they, they they, they get stuff that's much faster, much better than even we have, right? And it's amazing. I mean, you look at places in Africa where it's exploding with the cell phones and the mobile payments and how that just took off. And I think having a mobile system and payment structure gives a lot of power to the people where they say, hey, you know what? We can do a lot and we can create commerce extremely fast. And I think that's extremely powerful. And that has ripples into what happens into the economic system within that country and then eventually that region or other countries around it and the rest of the world. So with crypto, we're still at its infancy, but we're seeing a lot of countries and people really starting to look into it. Now, to go back to your question about the states and the regulation and anonymity, I think there's still going to be, and I think it's important to still maintain a level of regulation. I think it's important to have that to have a checks and balances. I do believe in checks and balances. I do believe that to have that creates a more stable society, more stable environment and government. When you have too much of this instability, then it becomes hard for anything to scale. Um, and I think that's extremely important that people understand that. And I think governments need to understand that. Um, what I think the problem is that governments have right now is that they're really looking at crypto in a very bad way, or at least blockchain. I mean, I think they understand that blockchain is a really good technology, but they're looking at the actual currencies as a negative thing. And I think they really need to look at it a little bit differently. Obviously, I'm biased because I'm, you know, founding token pay. But I think once they start to realize the benefits and how it can actually be helpful to their country versus harmful, I think that's when things will really ramp up. And I think we're definitely... Okay, so... so so that's, that's really interesting. Um, now, in the interest of, of you know being kind of neutral and, and making sure that we look at this from both sides, I'm gonna I'm gonna drill in a little bit, Go ahead. Uh, if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So anonymity. Um, you know, yes, it, it is it is good for the people, um, but um, it also has the potential to be used by um, bad actors. Sure. Um, as we've seen in the past with other anonymous technologies. Yeah. And, you know, if this, if this uh, anonymity were to become broadly available, the, the argument of, of the governments and, you know, law enforcement, regulatory agencies is the potential for misuse is, is great. And also, um, you know, there's, there's the, ch the challenge of simply, um, you know, providing a way for a large amount of, of, uh, of the economy to be outside of, a tax system. And so, you know, that governments view that as a threat, not a benefit. Uh, how could it also be beneficial? What, what's the case for, you know, this being beneficial to governments on a large scale? Or is it really not about the governments? It's about the people and kind of what's beneficial to them versus their governments? I think it's, I think it's both. I think it can be beneficial to the government and to the actual people people eventually have more power to be able to do and transact in the way that they want and the governments will be able to figure out exactly how to monetize and, and and profit from those transactions to benefit their thing i mean people at the end of the day understand the value of a government and i think that they wouldn't want it to be destroyed or disrupted in any way and if you ask a at least an american citizen you know what would be a certain type of fair tax or anything so that they can see that the roads are good and that there's a stable government and they have a strong military or whatever it is 
I think people are willing to accept and acknowledge that. I think that's not, that's, that's not an issue, right? So how, how can there be checks and balances in a system like that? I mean, for example, um, do, you, do, you see, do you think that um, governments might offer their own cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies, which are sort of approved, and then transactions go through those and are automatic, you know, automatically there's some kind of tax or small transaction fee, um, which might be less than what you'd normally pay in taxes, but in just a huge number of transactions might add up to a huge number for, for government. Is that the way it happens or, yeah. or something else? How, how could you have checks and balances if the whole system became fully anonymous? It's, it's hard to predict. I am not a government official. I, I really wouldn't know. However, China's starting to do that right now, right? I have people that I've contacted who are involved in the cryptocurrency space in China, and it's extremely interesting what they're doing. They've banned the ICOs, they've banned uh, the exchanges, and they have went to the miners and they couldn't bind the miners because it's a really weird rule, like shut down your factories of computers that are running to mine this digital asset. So they started raising their electricity rates so they can literally almost bankrupt the Chinese miners. China realizes the value of blockchain. China is a very smart country. They don't have four-year plans. They have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50-year plans. And they are going to have blockchain in their currency, whether it's going to be a pseudo RMB, whatever, or they're going to stop the RMB and just do it through their new one. I mean, it could be phases of it. It will happen. China realizes the value of blockchain. They want to have all the transactions done on China. They don't want anonymity. So they're choosing not to have... Right. So it would be a completely non-anonymous solution. They're choosing not because that is the government structure that they have. I mean, they're a different country and different... They're a country with a lot of different problems. You have a country with 1.3 billion people and they got to make sure it's very stable. I mean, it's very easy for a country that large to be unstable if you mess up on a few things, right? So, but they realize the value of the technology and they will not allow anonymity. Now, uh, right. I think they probably want a blockchain for almost everything you do. Um, so everything's on a ledger. You know, when you brush your teeth, it's registered. And, you know, when you wake up in the morning, it's on the blockchain. Everything you do, every, that's the goal over there. In the U.S., we're on the other side of the extreme in terms of, you know, having a, a, a much stronger belief in individual liberty uh, and, you know, the concept of certain freedoms that uh, the state cannot impinge upon. However... At the same time, mm -hmm. um, if really large transactions start moving through uh, the blockchain ecosystem, and if those transactions aren't taxable, mm -hmm. you know, will the world be a different place than it is today? Or is that already happening um, you know, through offshore jurisdictions and you know, the way that large companies yeah. um, avoid taxes? Is it already happening? Are we, will the world really be different, or is this just a better way to, you know, is this just a better way to do what's already happening? Or will it dramatically you know, deprive governments of of income, which, you know, in turn, completely changes the way the world is governed. Right. I think the, at this point, it's, it's still early for the states because the states is a very interesting country, right, where they have, you know, Bill of Rights and you have your First Amendment and freedom of speech and you have a lot of uh, ability to maintain that level of anonymity. And I think that's extremely important that, that we still maintain that. And, you know, China has its own thing, right? I think the, the power here would be the government's enforcing some level of an, a, a fees incurred through the exchanges. That's basically a, for now, a short-term solution to be able to receive tax revenues um, for something like that. All of these exchanges that are listed in the States have to have a money in exchange license in order to operate, and they can easily just raise taxes on that if they see the amount of transactions that take place. Um, you know, there's, there's that's a, a good point. You know, a yeah, lot. I mean, they could actually negotiate. Yeah. The governments can negotiate to basically say, look, if you don't want any risk, if you, you know, if you don't want the risk of, of regulators coming after you, um, and if you really want to, if you want to legitimately do business within our jurisdiction, yeah. um, you know, yes. you have to register, you have to, you know, be part, you have to participate in certain standards and and and, and pay uh, some kind of fees or taxes. Yeah. Um, and, and the negotiating power here, here where I think it's going to be interesting is that if cryptos and anonymous cryptos are able to get enough market share fast before the governments figure out how to regulate them, um, there'll actually be some pretty good negotiating leverage to work something out where um, effectively uh, the tax on these transactions is, is lower 
um, than probably what the government wants. Right. Um, but the government's still getting money, and, and everybody wins. It frees up the digital economy. Yeah, they, uh, uh, they, just, they just now tax all the babysitters in America. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, right. you think about right. it. I mean, uh, a babysitter that works, you know, at 15, 16 years old in somebody's house and gets paid 80 to $100 to take care of a couple kids, do you think that person registers and reports to the government how much money they came in? That's no. actually another good point. If, yeah. more trans, if more of the economy... Uh, was transacting in a system where a smaller fee was paid, the same amount of money could actually be made by government. So the point here is that for these, so. right, for these technologies to, to succeed really long term, there's only really two options. One is that the, the crypto economy completely disrupts and replaces the, the original fiat economy and the national government system of um, extracting the tax money from the economy. The weaker, That's one option. Yeah, the weaker governments today would fall under that category. That is correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. The other option is uh, governments or forward-looking governments embrace the technology and find a way to, to monetize it in a way that's compatible with the technology so it doesn't drive people outside of that solution to some other competing solution. Exactly. Um, and any government that can figure that out mm -hmm. and do it first could end up being the center of the world economy. Exactly. Exactly. And if the States doesn't get on their game, it's going to be a problem because Europe is on, is out there and they're, you know, they're a little slow, but there's some of the small, not just Europe. Right. I mean, it's, it's Europe. an interesting point because you have to have a combination of laws, political stability, law enforcement, um, you know, business infrastructure. If you have that supporting ecosystem uh, that where businesses want to transact, mm -hmm. um, probably because the taxes are lower, sure. um, you know, that's attractive. And so, you know, we think of disruption happening in the tech space, mm -hmm. um, but we don't really think of disruption happening in the political and economic space. Right, right, yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, it's happening, all coming together. And, and nobody really understands. this. Right. The kind of disruption that's taking place, or that could take place, it's like the internet. It's like, uh, you know, the rise of computers. It is a, it's a huge change. And governments aren't prepared. They don't even understand it. Their, their knee-jerk reaction is going to be to fight it. Mm -hmm. But if they can actually look at it the other way and think about how to, how to leverage it, it's a huge opportunity. And, and it may not be the incumbents that, yeah. that figure it out. It may not be the big governments of today that figure it out. It may be developing countries or new regions that get there first. And that could suddenly shift the balance just like – you know, when Google came out, it shifted the balance away from HP. Yeah. You know, nobody expected that to happen, and it did. Yeah. This, it could happen digitally, and that's the threat to governments and also the incentive for them to get involved in these technologies and actually find a way, find a way to, to work with these companies and use these technologies instead of opposing them. Yeah, and I think, I think it all starts with, uh, you know, to some extent, what are the conversations that are happening in Washington, at least here in this country, and what's going on. But I will tell you this, that it, the first country uh, that will adopt that solution will not be the United States, and it's not a, and nothing against it. It's just that the smaller countries out there have to prove it. Um, so a country like Vanuatu, uh, for example, could do it. And if, if inter it's interesting, right? Why is it that the smallest countries in the world sometimes are one of the most richest in regards to wealth and assets? Hong Kong, Singapore, right? Taiwan. Uh, certain parts in, you know, How about the UAE. Okay. Right. I mean, the, and it's a the ratio of population to income, you know, it's terrific. Well, but why is that? It's because when you have a country that has no natural resources, they don't have the, the certain type of labor or whatever it is, they will scrape and claw and figure out what's going to set them apart to make sure it, it can succeed. Right. And I think those are the countries that are going to be more open to, adopting this right Vanuatu well it's just like the startup economy yeah. effectively uh, you know their startups are usually smaller innovation usually comes yeah. actually from smaller yeah. companies because yeah. they, they they're hungry they need it they're willing to experiment yeah. uh, and, and you know the larger established players can't do that because they're supporting yeah. legacy systems that that you know they don't have a way to do that right I mean you know like I say Vanuatu a lot but it's a great example I've studied a lot about Vanuatu since I started getting involved and, and negotiating with with, with with the bank, I mean, the first one of the first countries to accept citizenship with, with Bitcoin. I mean, you can buy citizenship with Bitcoin. 
Uh, it started with Switzerland and you know being able to do stuff with 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 government transactions. Switzerland's a small country, extremely wealthy, you know. And I think that one once you have one of those smaller countries, and maybe it's Vanuatu, maybe it's Fiji, who knows? I mean, then you'll they'll see, they'll test, they'll see how it works, and and then slowly we'll adopt it. You know, the big countries will adopt it, and I think that's fine. I think that's uh, we're looking at five, maybe ten years away between when that starts and when it starts to happen here. Um, and I think it's, it'll be very fun. interesting. It'll be fine. Yeah. Now, now turning back to, to token pay uh, a little bit. So that's, that's helpful to look at the larger context. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the, in the, in the token pay vision, um, and, you know, first of all, I just want to ask, um, looking at the timeline, you know, going back in time, token pay actually has, um, DNA going back to what, 2015 with ethan.com. Yeah. So, so tell us just a little bit about what, what is that? Kind of how did token pay go from there to where it is today? Sure. I think I can go even further than that because uh, this is, this is sure. how it start, it's kind of started. After I graduated university, I worked at a hedge fund for about three and a half, four years and um, called Everest Capital. I worked there and I saw the significant advantage that institutions had and that the little people didn't have, the, the, the retail investors didn't have. And... People were paying, you know, a hedge fund pays $2,000 per computer to access Bloomberg. So not only was the company paying my salary, they were paying 20 something thousand dollars for me to have access to information that was not ready to be available to anybody that can, you know, anybody out there, the retail investor. And I thought, wow, you know, that's kind of unfair, but the more money you have in that situation, the more power you have, whether you can transact faster. I mean, there were so many benefits for a hedge fund to have that. And then... I kind of got disillusioned for, and I felt bad for the retail investor because at the end of the day, they were at a major disadvantage, extremely, extremely uh, major disadvantages. And so for a retail investor, the safest thing is to put an index fund or whatever and just kind of put it there and forget it. And then honestly, it's kind of hard to do that when you have managements that aren't doing a good job, there's no accountability for how you run a corporation, et cetera, and there's hedge funds and major corporations that are going in, taking massive stakes in these companies, making poor, poor choices for these businesses that are right short term to make quick profits, but wrong for the investors long term. And I got really demotivated by that. I actually left in 2007, right before the economic collapse. It was May, June 1st, 2007 is when I quit the company. And I said, you know what? I need to get out of here. I started getting white hair in my hair. And it's 20, I was 24, 25 when I left my job. I started at 21, really young. And I said, you know what, I maybe want to get an MBA and I wanted to uh, travel. And, but but to that time that I had was about a year. I want to learn something. And so I went, went to China. I said, this is the one. Brick was a really popular term back then, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And I said, this is, this is the, the thing. This is the future China. And I decided I'm going to go study Mandarin, et cetera. I, I loved it. I said, I'm not going to the States. Um, I love it. Then the economic collapse happened, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is horrible. How can I get a job back home? I'm in the finance industry. I had people with MBAs and families, et cetera, like just losing their jobs. I mean, there's no way that a 25-year-old with only three years' experience would get a job over somebody with an MBA and 10 years of experience in Wall Street, you know, not get a job, Right. And so then I started a business in China. I saw how to interact with the government, et cetera. And I still had this thing about finance and kind of changing the perspective and providing tools that hedge funds had and providing it for regular people. So that mindset of helping people and helping them understand that they can have an edge if they had the knowledge and information. So even uh, first version or the version that we had was essentially a credit score for stocks but we would categorize it into five categories, whether it was um, how the stock was performing based on uh, trends, so technical. Another one was how it was trading fundamentally on financial. The other one was how, what was the, 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 the rating versus economic conditions or industry conditions. And then the other one it was management, was how they were performing, what was the government's. And we would get those four essentially scores or five, I'm trying to remember what the last one was. And we would combine that. It would give you an overall score, literally like a FICO score, but we will call it EFIN. Uh, we had the domain, uh, e, of, e as an electronic or whatever in finance. And we saw that there was an opportunity there, but we decided to pivot because I spoke at MIT. 
uh, with a partner of ours called uh, Tony Rasinghe, which is uh, the CEO of U Stock Trade. And when I was at MIT, um, my mind was set was still stocks, and this is the you know this is what I want to do. I've always wanted to be into stocks and all that. And I went to MIT. I saw a few projects and a few speeches about blockchain, and it just kind of started you know clicking. It started making sense. I have always been involved with tech. I would go to tech conferences while working at the hedge fund. I have plenty of my friends that are in Silicon Valley and Santa Clara, you know, San Jose area, doing a ton of stuff. And when I went to this conference, it just all started to come together. I connected dots and I said, uh, we started talking to some of our team members and I said, you know what, like, I think this may be a good opportunity for us to pivot. Uh, but we didn't know how we wanted to learn. So we just started researching, understanding exactly what this was, how we can get involved and who are the people that we can respect. Hence how we approached uh, uh, Sunarok, a, a developer from Verge. And then, you know, that's how it all started. But, you know, there's always a background story, right? And I want to make that clear of how I got there, what's the mindset, and how we eventually evolved to where we are today. Tell me about the, the on the team, who is sort of the technical brains and, and the, the kind of crypto expert on the team? Yeah, so we basically have Carlos Azar who's doing more on the on the tech side for for infrastructure of the website and all that for the business side. So Sunarok basically was able to help us work, work with a couple of other developers. They didn't want to remain anonymous, but they're developers that we hired uh, to essentially help us build the actual blockchain. And we looked at a few other things and we kind of put it all together. So um, so yeah, that's what we did. Okay, um, so. Let's let's zoom in a little bit. How how much time was spent on development of the the actual technology? Took about three to four months to actually from start to finish to actually go in and uh, look at the code and kind of modify it and then test it, make sure it worked, uh, make sure our wallets worked, uh, you know, to the standards that we wanted. And yeah, it, it took about three to four months. Okay, and then after that, did you go through a test period or an audit period? Yes, we did. That was uh, that's the value that we had with like uh, Sunura coming in and making sure it worked. And yeah, we tested it, and that that's yeah. It took about a month or so for that. Okay, so um, in, let me ask you. I'm going to ask you a hard question, but it's it's important. Um, you know, if it if it took, it sounds like about five or six months to do the technical work behind the project. Mm -hmm. You know, what would prevent somebody else from just doing the same thing? What's hard? Is so it what's what's unique or defensible? I think what what happens is a lot of there's a lot of copycats out there, and it's very easy to copycat. A lot of these codes are open sourced, right? And we're even debating how much we want to put open sourced and not. And it's very easy to copy the code. The most difficult thing is creating adoption. It's creating a community around it. So the first phase that we thought was important was creating a community. Once you create that community. Uh, then you provide solutions for that community to expand and scale at a much faster space, uh, pace. What is the difference between Square and PayPal? Or what is it between Square, PayPal, and a bunch of other merchant services? Pretty much the same, but if you look at their marketing and how they're able to build a certain type of niche and then how they grew that niche to others and how they exploded, I think it's extremely important. I mean, we're already talking to a lot of major partners to integrate uh, our merchant services API which we're, we're in the middle of still in, the, in development, but they already like what we're trying to offer and what we're trying to execute on, ours, on our side so that they can integrate it so they can start accepting you know, crypto payments. There's already a company out there that does it, but if they don't execute right on the business side and get the right relationships and the right partnerships to get it going, then they're, they're going to go nowhere, right? So Yeah, I mean, so one thing I, I would say is it, it, your team does have more of a, Kind of finance and business background than some of the crypto teams I've talked to, um, in the sense that yeah. you know you're really thinking about this as a business, um, not just a technology or a project. Yeah, and I from think, that perspective, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I, I think that's well, from that perspective. Important, yeah. <laughs> so you're really thinking of this as a business, which is is a differentiator. Um, one of the things that jumped out um, was the fact that you're looking to actually buy a real bank in you know, in, in a jurisdiction where uh, you, you can operate anonymously. And that, that's pretty interesting. I haven't, I haven't actually come across uh, another crypto project that's gone that far down the path of, of actually 
you know, finding a way to interface with the banking system by owning a real bank. Yeah. So that is, that's very different from what I've seen so mm -hmm. far. Now, I don't know if you've heard of anybody else trying to do that. Are you the first to try to do that? No, we're not the first. Uh, I think people have tried or said to, but the difference is, is uh, what they say is different from what they're actually doing. We actually have a letter of intent to buy this 20 year old bank. Uh, but mm -hmm. if, if the deal falls apart, you know, there's other banks or we can form another one. I mean, Buying a bank that's already established is definitely much better than forming a new bank. It's a different process. I just 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 learning how this all works and operates and in, 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 in operating and opening up a bank offshore. It's it's not easy, right? A lot of regulation, a lot of stuff that you have to go through, right? Um, and for us, it's depending on how much we 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 sell in, in token sale. I mean, if it's Vanuatu's one jurisdiction. We could work with three or four jurisdictions because maybe one jurisdiction caters to one type of client and maybe not to another. And that's, that's certainly the case. Uh, you can, mm -hmm. you know, Vanuatu may say no to, I mean, an example may, may not, may say no to people living in Costa Rica, but then you'll have another jurisdiction and say Liechtenstein that says, yeah, sure, no problem. So, right. um, you know, for us, we look at it as if there's an op opportunity to have more of a, uh, a private label situation where we have our token pay, you know, platform and we integrate with different backs to cater to different customers so that it makes it more readily accessible. Then that's something that we will do. Um, but we have, right. for our so, these things have, you know, things change. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, you know, that the differentiators here, um, you know, it, it seems to me that it's, it's really the combination of, um, a more anonymous um, transaction system mm -hmm. with uh, a, an actual bank or many banks, um, at least you have the intent to acquire and integrate with. So that's it's kind of an interesting combination where you have real banks paired with a really anonymous transaction system. Yeah, I think what, what it is is a, somebody can have the option of one or the other or both, okay? And I think if they only want to do the transaction anonymously within TPay or token pay, they can do that. If they want to be able to go and get the transactions that are based on the blockchain, right? And they're all very clear that it's on the blockchain and it's very transparent because it's on the blockchain, then you can go and integrate with the bank and convert to fiat, et cetera, right? And if you want to have that, you can do that. And I think that's what we want. We want to be able to give people the choice, right? And now let me ask you, let me ask you another question. We've talked a lot about kind of the transaction use case, but you also have mentioned some other uses for what you guys have built. One was um, real time, or I guess it was uh, chat type communication, um, maybe other forms asynchronous. I'm not sure if it supports that, but uh, what about the potential for using this to share data uh, or, or uh, you know, content? Within the chat system? Well, yes, within your infrastructure, uh, if you can chat, um, then yeah, conceivably you could share well. other kinds of information too. There's, there's, there's a lot of applications that can be done as well that would also be able to be incorporated, right, with, with the actual technology we have in hand, right? Whether it's big data, whether it's larger file transfers, which is decentralized data, decentralized email, decentralized messaging system, which kind of is right now if you think about it. Um, there's a lot of applications, but we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We want to be able to execute on what we have right now on the current blockchain and then go from there to the more business side and kind of get that. And then eventually if we see a need for something and we see that users that we currently have are able to want that service, then we'll offer it. I mean, it's like Google AdWords starting with ads and then all of a sudden they had Gmail and then they had maps and they had other stuff in us because they saw these things and they also saw a monetary business opportunity right so yeah now um, today your, your the system works people can actually use it to do transactions although it's not funded yet right yeah so what what we've done is we've operated the blockchain we kind of paused it now for security reasons uh, we will launch it as soon as the token sale finishes and then once that's done we distribute everything so basically we have all the coins that are readily really available. We have the breakdown as we have in our, our, our white paper. And then once we distribute the coins to the people, then they can start using them and transacting. Uh, one of the benefits that I, I didn't mention before is that we are a proof of stake coin, not a proof of work coin. And so anybody that joins or buys or uses the coin from day one, if they stake their coins, which is basically their, um, 
they call it forging. That's the kind of technical term. But essentially, they, they're basically getting a 5% return on those coins if they essentially run their computer 24-7 for a whole year. And that's basically, whenever you stake your coins, you're letting the system know that you are using your computer to essentially uh, provide a decentralized network. Okay. What happens if in that situation um, you go offline or, you know, it doesn't have to be on a server or, you know, could people be doing this on their phones, on their laptops? For right now, it's on the desktop. I know some other companies are trying to do it so you can mine with your phone. You can't really physically mine with your phone. It's too power intensive really to do it. It's more of a micro mining thing where you're using certain aspects of your processing to do like a point something percent of of, of, of the actual transaction. As computers and smartphones become stronger and more powerful, as powerful as desktops, then you'll definitely see the ability to be able to do that. But people are starting to go away from mining. Uh, mining is 2009. If you think about it, it's a really old technology. I mean, it's a waste of energy to spend money on solving mathematical problems just to you know process a blockchain and you know increase the hash, right? And when you have things like proof of stake where you don't really need to mine and don't need to spend all that money and energy and computers and you're getting the same benefit. The benefit at the end of the day is it's a centralized network. How do we have a decentralized network where as one computer turns off, the whole system doesn't shut down? And I think that's the, the goal, right? Or that's what, that's what they're all trying to aim for. At least that's what... It's for. like the internet, but for money. That is correct. That is correct. So um, for, with, with us and, and anybody that's even Ethereum, which is the top, you know, top two coin out there, they're, they're, they've already pivoted to proof of stake because they realize the value. So what we did was, will proof of stake will proof of stake um, result in an energy savings um, compared to um, you know the huge amount of energy that's being used right now to mine? Do you well, think absolutely. that ultimately it saves yeah. energy, or will pretty much the same amount of energy be used, um, but just not by miners? Rather, it'll be used at the edges. That's actually an interesting question. In, if you if you get the same amount of people right now who are mining versus the same amount of people that are staking, you would immediately save uh, a ton of energy because the amount of power that you need and energy to actually power these mines is intense. I mean, I'm talking about if you run, run, had a mining ring at your house, you're talking about an extra few hundred dollars a month, if not more, just running one. Well, there are, there are actually some, 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 I've seen some uh, business plans uh, where they're basically offering people free heat. <laughs> if they install yeah. a mining rig in their house, it just heats their house. And so, you know, I think it's a, it is a really, it's a big deal um, you know, if proof of stake is greener, basically, if it uses less energy and produces less heat, um, you know, ultimately it's going to win. It has to be the, the winner um, is, simply it is, because it is the winner yeah. already today and it will be. But the, the interesting thing is, is the reason why, okay, let's look at it like this. There's, um, let's say there's a hundred computers right now, right? And you can argue how many of them are mining right now. Let's assume that right now it's 90% or whatever, because most of the uh, computers are out there needed to mine and transact this blockchain. You need a lot of power, right? But if, if you start to see more and more people just kind of get into the proof of stake uh, coins like, like us, token pay and Ethereum, more and more computers are starting to be gone on proof of stake. And then the cost of energy continues to go up for the miners. And essentially it just becomes a, a battle. It's a battle of costs where with proof of stake, you don't have to fight that battle at all, right? And the more people you have in the proof of stake network, essentially you're going to be consuming more energy, but that's more on an individual basis. It's not any different. Hold on, you got a little quieter. Come closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. So it's not any different from, it's not any different from essentially anybody just running their computer every day and working, right? It's just, they can literally turn on a computer and start staking and it, it won't be a problem. Um, so I think what, what ends up happening is you'll have this massive shift, believe it or not, where Bitcoin will still have miners, but uh, it's going to be harder and harder for them to justify the cost of all these electricity expenses, especially what's happening with China, where they're you know, ramping up the prices really hard to essentially bank up these miners. That's why they're moving to Russia, Mongolia, and other parts of the world, because it's just unsustainable. And I think when you ever, whenever you see a situation where cost of labor rises, it's always a battle, right? Uh, you know, we move manufacturing from the States to Mexico, then from Mexico to China, and then China to, you know, parts of, uh, you know, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and then now even some parts of, of Africa. And it's just this game that just makes it harder and harder. And I think people are going to realize that it's just not worth it. And I think we're going to see a massive shift to proof of stake uh, uh, solutions. And that's why Ethereum is going to 
be one of the more popular options in the next, you know, easily five to 10 years because it is. Mistake. Now, token pay, when we talk about this, um, one question is, does, does the blockchain um, or any as aspect of the system um, come from a previously existing code base? Did you branch a code base or, or start from one um, or spawn from one? Yeah, um, or did you build this from the ground up? No, no, this is, this is, a, this is essentially, a, you can call it a fork of Bitcoin. We used the Bitcoin source code. That was the foundation. And then we used other features of other coins that we thought were good. And then we added a few other modifications to some of those features. We did, we worked on the actual software. We developed a few things. We're actually still working on the software um, and then going from there. So it's officially called a fork of Bitcoin um, or a spawn of Bitcoin. I guess that's the, the right word to use, but using a lot of the better features out there that we thought were good. And these are some of these projects have been failed, but and, and there are a lot of projects out there that are really good and we've contacted some of these developers and we asked them, you know, what can we, how can we work together and in integrating some of the stuff and they were very open to it as well. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, that's how we kind of developed it. Okay. Some other questions on, along that, that line. So, you know, there's been criticism recently of the potential for, uh, well, let's just say there's been criticism of Bitcoin uh, on the ground. So it's not going to scale. Um, that fees are going up um, and that, you know, the block size is too small. Yep. Um, and so we saw the emergence of Bitcoin Cash, for yeah. example, um, and in other alternatives. Um, and then, of course, there's other systems like Litecoin, you know, which are faster. Um, so, you know, where do you fall in that spectrum? Have you solved that? Do you have a larger block size or do you have a solution to scale this if it gets very successful? Um, you know, do you have the same? Do you, do you basically have to go towards something like Lightning um, where do you see scaling in the future? Yeah, so I think because we're proof of stake that requires less, 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 less pr problems in regards to the blockchain and we're not proof of work, that's also another benefit. So the fee issue is the proof of work problem. If you're spending a lot of money generating electricity or spending a lot of money uh, with computers and, and causing a lot of electricity, these miners want to be compensated for being able to, to do this. So that's where you have this, uh, this whole expensive fees, et cetera. You, you don't have that with proof of stake because there is no expensive infrastructure in place that has the rights to charge you that, right? That's why Ethereum and, and, and people like us are using proof of stake because it just, it just makes sense, right? Longer term, it just makes sense to be able to charge this. Um, so, so yeah. Okay, so what would stop, yeah. what would stop say, you know, uh, I, I guess you could say there could be a, a fork of Bitcoin that would, that would be proof of stake, right? It could. And I think that could actually change a lot of things. So it, mm -hmm. the problem is, is that all these, the people that are causing the forks are people, yeah, people have to understand Bitcoin is no longer decentralized. It's decentralized in the way the network is working, right? You don't, you can't shut down one computer. What, what the way it's become centralized is the, the governance is not decentralized is really what you're saying. Correct. The, the, um, it, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of influence on, you know, from certain parties. They're mining, they're mining that control a certain percentage. And then when they get together, right. And they make votes and they decide whether they do this or not, then that's kind of pretty centralized. Right. So um, what, what I think what's happening is if there's someone out there that decides that they want to, you know, kind of fork into a Bitcoin proof of stake, that actually may be the longer term better solution than all these other ones. I mean, uh, having a faster block, you know, transaction speed and, and larger blockchain size, of, that's absolutely important. But I think the issue is, is, you know, how do you continue to, to, to um, make it so that it's stable? Uh, that's important. I think people understand that you want to make sure that it's stable and make sure that uh, you have a network that's strong and that still maintains its decentralization. And it, it could happen, so, but, it, you know, we, we won't it know. It could happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, it probably, there probably will be forks, um, the, the experiment with that, but whether or not the, right. the folks that are kind of in, in control right now will, will, right. will endorse that is a question. Right. Let, me, let me kind of ask you this. On, on the side of token pay, how is governance going to work? Uh, you know, what if you know, the same thing happens with token pay and either the company and or, you know, larger investors or parties that aggregate a lot of, a lot of the um, market cap, you know, become kind of influential over policy. How, you know, how does voting work? How do you, how do you ensure that that doesn't also happen here? 
Yeah, right now we haven't incorporated a voting system or anything like that. Right, right now, as of today, we are technically 100% centralized, right? Because we have all these- From a governance, from a governance standpoint, not an infrastructure standpoint. Correct, correct. We're, we're essentially, control, we've controlled that. We have decentralized infrastructure, centralized governance under a company. Today, right? today but yeah. over the time, okay. through the token sale, as we distribute and sell all of these coins, it becomes even more and more and more decentralized, right? In that the owners of the coins are no longer in one entity. Correct. They're, 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 right. they're and we have no incentive to be more than 50% or whatever. I mean, we have zero incentive to be right. that way because if we did, then we would not have, uh, we would control the proof of stake rewards. We would control so much. We could, you know, we can't shut down, but I mean, you would just be able to do a lot, right? And, and right, you don't want to have a kind of fifty-one percent situation. No, no, a fifty-one percent attack is, is usually just the, the exactly. You're, you're when you have a fifty-one percent attack on a proof of work, essentially, it's to literally alter transactions and stuff like that, and that's really hard to do with proof of work because of the um, the uh, the the cost of energy and power to do that with proof of stake. Uh, you could technically own a bunch of those coins, but I mean, the whole point is that if that's the case, people are going to just raise the price insanely high to give up that right to do that. But essentially, if somebody in the community finds out that there is somebody that owns more than 50%, it's very possible that the community will just walk away and let it crash. And that's the fear of why you cannot have a centralized system because eventually if it's not decentralized to a point where um, it creates a... It's not safe if it's too centralized, is what you're saying. That, that defeats the whole purpose. Right. Of what of what's going on. So so in so just to answer the question then, how are you going to decentralize governance over time? Uh, we haven't decided yet. We 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 figured that the best thing to do is just launch it and see what happens with the actual community. Uh, if we decide to open source all of the code and basically allow a developer community to come in and actually start improving some of the more technical and privacy oriented features, then we'll let that run itself and, and the developers will essentially work with a system where if there's features or if there's things that people are interested in doing then we'll be able to integrate that um we're still way too early right now to to actually go remember bitcoin's uh, eight years old more or less and they're now basically this past year has been crazy right with all the forks there have been i think four forks already um and there's another one planned with that segwit which is segregated witness two um so for us we we want to stay away from the governance. I think at the end of the day, we want the people uh, to be able to monitor that and control that. I think the developers, which will be for us now, and then over time, we'll slowly start to you know go away from some level of that development because uh, we tru truly believe that if the more power you give to the people, the more uh, support that you'll have on the community to be able to appreciate and adopt the actual uh, coin. So let me just ask you a few more questions um, and, and then we'll finish up. Um, real quick answers here. You know, can, what are the top three um, privacy oriented coins out there today and how does token pay compare to each one? So there's in a, um, in a sentence or two. I, I would say the top three are uh, uh, Zcash, Monero and Verge. Those are the top three. And, and you've got Verge, you've got the guy who created Verge advising you. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the main differences? They're, I believe they're all using proof of, proof of work. So that's obviously very expensive to, to be able to it's make. a big difference. Yeah. Uh, so from us, that's, that's a very key, key differentiator. Uh, Monero has definitely a, rep, a very poor reputation, but they've, there's been, I don't want to confirm these sources, but there's sources that are actually leaking IP addresses through their mass, through their nodes. So, um, it's an issue. Uh, we've talked to some people in the developer community, like what, what's going on and what ends up happening is the way they built the infrastructure. It's actually creating an ability that it's not anonymous and that's a really big concern. It hasn't affected uh, uh, the actual uh, price or anything like that, but I mean, that is a concern. Uh, I think uh, with Zcash, I think it's more of the uh, adoption and how that's being adopted. We are taking more of a business approach to it uh, definitely integrating with a lot more businesses and retail, et cetera. So, I mean, that's basically what we see as a major differentiator, but between those three, I mean, there's, there's always about five to 10 or so percent difference in how they operate. Some are able to do better marketing and better execution with certain things here and there. 
Um, and I think, over, I think it's still it's still early to determine who's the best, who's number one, and who's gonna who's gonna take over the, the realm of of what's the next Bitcoin on the privacy, right? So I think that's fair to say. I mean, they all have their. Is, is the is the acquisition of a bank in your case, in terms of a piece, a piece of the strategy, diff, of a big differentiator from those three absolutely. companies that, absolutely. or I should say, yeah. coins. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you look at Zcash, Zcash is actually operated in the States. They actually have a U.S. corporation and they're very uh, American oriented. And I haven't really heard anything about them deciding to buy a bank. I think that they really didn't want to do it or, or may not be interested in that. Um, well, if they're in the U.S., it also kind of makes it difficult. Very, very difficult, right? Yeah. So we decided, you know, we wouldn't want to take too much of a U.S. stance. We thought that there's a bigger world outside mm -hmm. of the United States. Yeah. No offense. I mean, I lived abroad for eight years. And sure. I, I saw it and I, you know, married to, a, you know, Chinese woman. And I, you know, I just see the world differently. Um, and I think that is a major difference. I know Verge is not going to buy a bank <laughs> at all. Uh, and that's not their intention. But uh, there's definitely levels of cooperation where we can work with them uh, in different ways. And, you know, we'll work with Zcash if that's the case. I mean, there's, there's always opportunities. I, I, I learned a long time ago not to look at competitors or anybody else's enemies in any way. There's always ways to work together to kind of go to the same goal. I mean, I think right now all of these blockchains and all these projects really have to work together more than the fight and try to see who's better and who's worse. Right. Because I think we're trying to solve a bigger problem, right. Which is, how do we, you know, work on a, on a system that actually makes sense for governments and, you know, people all over the world? Good answer. Uh, okay. So let's, um, I think, just quickly uh, close with just a summary of um, what you are raising, uh, how much you're raising, um, when that starts, um, if there's uh, an amount that you've raised so far that you want to cite, um, you're welcome to. But just basically a quick overview of your fundraising to date and your fundraising goals and, and kind of the use of proceeds. Right. So we, uh, we have uh, essentially decided to uh, put a hard cap of 5,000 Bitcoin. When we started the project, Bitcoin was about two or $3,000, and that's really gone away from us. So what we decided to do was increase uh, our bonuses. We felt the bonuses were something that the community was really attracted to. So we increased our bonus to 100% and also have a referral system. Uh, it's imperative for us to have a really strong decentralized network. So what we want is to have as many people inside of the network uh, that actually uh, are starting to use the coin and stake the coin. That's extremely important because that's really what sets up the network. So having bonuses and having a large network. I mean, I'd rather have uh, 100,000 people with smaller transactions than you know 10,000 people with large transactions because again that would still be a certain level of centralization right um, we expect to raise between you know depending on a lot of factors between maybe a thousand five hundred Bitcoin to maybe three thousand something Bitcoin depending on how much is raised the first day or first week and then how it goes through the rest of the actual token sale process um, which we have a little bit lower referral bonus and actual bonus, which is drops from 100% to 50%. Uh, we have bootstrapped the majority of the project. We did small, very, very tiny uh, private sale, um, but it was just essentially to help us fund for some of the marketing. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, that's, that's, all we, that's all we've done so far. And then use of proceeds, uh, you know, some of this obviously is, is going to be put into further development. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about kind of the big priorities um, in, once you have the funds to really start to push? Yeah, if we decide to purchase a bank, depending on the banks uh, and, the and where they're located, whether it's going to be in Vanuatu, I mean, that's our first choice, whether it's in Liechtenstein or maybe somewhere else. I mean, you're talking from starting at five to seven million dollars to purchase that bank to you know 10 to 20 million dollars depending on jurisdiction uh the operation how many assets that bank has etc when you start to integrate the api it's not so much the technology that's there you have to make sure it's good and tested well but you also have to have the team and customer support to be able to maintain all the inquiries that you're going to get from customers uh that are going to be integrating all of that so there's a lot of operational costs once you start ramping up then you also have the marketing costs that essentially you need for a regular business right um, but we think we already have some pretty strong relationships where once we have a, a test out there, an alpha version, and then also a beta version, that we'll be able to kind of scale it pretty quickly. Um, so the biggest costs are really the bank, then also uh, building up the infrastructure of the actual team. 
Another thing that we have on the white paper is also have an exchange, so that way we have an internal exchange, uh, so that way our bank can have an exchange that works with our own customers that is private, so it's just within the exchange, so that way the exchange is able to see all the transactions that take place and offer lower fees than potentially some of the other exchanges that are out there, whether it's Coinbase or whatever it is. Um, we, and that provides us, the reason why we're raising a little bit of that third tier is to provide more liquidity for that to, to occur. Uh, and, and that liquidity essentially helps it to make faster and um, essentially make it better for our customers to have a be better experience. So Derek, um, you know, it's very helpful. And just to summarize, um, if you were gonna choose you know, three or four uh, main points uh, that kind of summarize and explain the value of, of and differentiators for token pay, you know, what would that be? Yeah, the first thing is that we're the most secure coin out there, right? We're focused on privacy and security. We think that's extremely important. Uh, we forked off, spawned off the Bitcoin blockchain, and essentially have a lot more uh, security and privacy focused features that sets us apart from anyone else out there. The second thing is we're also a proof of stake coin versus a proof of work coin that actually reduces the amount of forks and all the craziness of the stuff that's happening out there with Bitcoin, but also it, it's uh, more energy efficient. So there's no need for expensive machines that need to pr be purchased and essentially to create the decentralized network. The third thing is we actually have a management team that actually has strong expertise in banking. Our CFO is actually second in command in a large regional bank that actually does M&A on a daily basis. So we are obviously integrating a bank into our platform so that we can make it easy for people to transact in crypto to hard assets and having somebody with, this, you know, with, with that experience is extremely important. And I think the fourth thing is we have somebody like the developer of Verge who has been auditing our blockchain and has been around for you know five five years or so and been doing this and he's essentially helping us to make sure that we are the leader in this type of you know mission that we have which is to create this level of privacy security for everybody terrific well thanks a lot this has been a very informative and, and helpful um, you know I'm, I'm encouraged by what I've heard um, you know I I think that you know where where I come out on this is you know, I, I've been in a lot of different crypto deals, um, and uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, I, I usually want to know a lot about the company more than I more than is in the white paper. So it's helpful to have this conversation, and hopefully, others um, who are considering this um, will benefit, uh, you know, from this kind of very long uh, and and I think very open discussion um, to understand your intent. It's, it's good to hear um, kind of your longer view and, and the team that you've brought together. And, and I wish you a lot of success. So uh, thanks a lot for your time. Oh, yeah. And uh, let's, let's definitely stay in touch and uh, continue the conversation. Great. Thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate it. And uh, I am an open book. You can contact me through email. Uh, email is uh, dc at tokenpay.com. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn, our Telegram chat has definitely opportunities to reach out to me. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of stigma with all of these uh, token sales that are going on and not having a level of transparency. And we've been extremely transparent, 60 something page white paper. I mean, you name it, we've been uh, as best as we can letting the community and other people out there know what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish and that we are a team that can actually execute. So uh, again, thanks Excellent. for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, bye-bye. So, hey, guys. Okay, now we're not recording anymore? Hold on.